Good morning, and welcome to The Mental Breakdown. I'm Dr. Bernie Wilkinson. And I'm Dr. Richard Marshall. And this morning, we're gonna talk about the futility of arguing with teens. Richard. Good morning. Good morning. It Happy is a Friday. Wonderful Friday. A fantastic this Friday. Is day, isn't Fabulous it? Friday. It's sort of a. That's right. <laughs> I've got a lot of work day. to do this weekend. <laughs> right. So uh, yeah, it feels a like a Wednesday. <laughs> so, but today we're going to talk about a, a, a frustration that I think every parent, especially parents of teenagers, parents of teens, uh, right. experience, and that is the futility of arguing with teenagers. Ah, oh, thank you. Yeah. We need to talk about this. It's um, it, it's an ever increasing problem, I think. Oh. You know, I the I, I was talking to a, a family the other day, and the mother made a comment. She said, you know, talking to her son, she said, you know, if this was forty or fifty years ago, um, <laughs> you probably would have just gotten slapped instead of us having this discussion. That's right. And and there's a lot of truth to that. Right. You know, in, in previous generations, we didn't maybe have as much uh, as many arguments between <laughs> parents and teenagers because. Corporal punishment was something that was so frequently used uh, and not reported. To. And, and, <laughs> that's right. And nobody knew about it. Um, we, I, I'm, no. I am consistently speaking of that. This is not, not quite off side. topic, that's but okay. I am consistently surprised by adults I talk, who I talk to who say that when they were kids and teenagers, they couldn't dress out in PE at school because they had marks on them and their parents would get in trouble. <laughs> so they just didn't dress. So out. they didn't dress out at PE. I'm it, that's, that's astounding to me, and it's scary. It's not a. It's not really a laughing matter, but no. But no. It, let's face it. A generation or two ago, uh, things were different. Things were different. Let's just leave it with that. <laughs> what, things my, were very different. My wife was telling me a story. They were at a tennis court, and there was a girl in the court, and she swore. She made some little profanity, you know, out of mm-hmm. frustration. And the girl's mother said, uh, "Ask her to stop or something. You shouldn't talk like that." And this guy walked by. And said, <laughs> Said, if that was my daughter, I'd have knocked her teeth out. <laughs> and I thought, that's another generation. It's it another generation. It is. You know? It is. Um, uh, so I laughed when she told me the story. I just laughed because I could picture some grizzled old guy in his 60s saying, that's my daughter, I'd have knocked her teeth out. <laughs> that was a quick uh, intervention. That's evidence right. Based, that's an evidence-based intervention. That's but people right. always say that. I mean, you hear it over and over again that uh, that wouldn't have been tolerated right? When uh, years ago. Um, we just would have been dealt with. And most people say that. My parents would never have put right. up with that. Right. You know? and, so. and and I think that recognizing, as you sort of alluded, that it, that was a very different time. That there were there were lots of things in our society that right. made you know the, the 50s and, and 60s and even 70s very different than it is today. Right. right. And so those, those antiquated methods of parenting just just don't work for the majority of kids because mm-hmm. really because our society doesn't mm-hmm. handle it the way that it used to that's right that's right it's culture it's, i mean remember there was a time and again this isn't a laughing matter matter either but there was a time when husbands were more or less oh, permitted wow. to hit wild. their wives right mm-hmm. and, and that was not appropriate and 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 has you know thankfully been um right. been uh, addressed or we're work, continuing to work to address mm-hmm. it um, but this is the same thing with kids. Caning. Right. The, the whole concept of caning, which was perfectly acceptable right. not too long ago right. in many, many schools. Um, paddling, caning. In, in the British school system, caning was routinely done not, yeah. only for di- not only for behavior, but for academic underachievement. You, know, you right. got caned if you couldn't read or you couldn't write. Um, so, yeah. you know, we don't want to hearken back to the good old days because sometimes right. the good old days weren't so good at all exactly. for some people, exactly. including women and children. So. Right, right. So, so today we have we have this new new challenge because since society has changed and things have shifted in the way that they have, now we get into situations where we have many more discussions than parents did in the past with their teenagers. That's right. and you can't resort to a slap in the face. Right. In, in today's world, you know, you go to school today with fingerprints across your cheek. Yeah somebody's going to hear about it. Yeah. Um, 50 years ago, 
nobody heard about it. Right. I mean, it was, nobody, nobody talked about it. Yeah, it was just said, what'd you do? What, what mm-hmm. happened? Why, you know, why well, did you get that? And then, you know, the assumption was you, the child did something wrong and well, deserved it. But let's, and let's, let's be, be honest too. Sometimes if a kid went to school with fingerprints on their face, you weren't necessarily sure if the parent did it or if the neighbor did it or if the teacher did it or if the principal did it. It could have been any number of people. Any number of adults. Because that's the way that they were, it things was, were managed back at that they time. Were all permitted. That's right. It was tolerated. Today it's not. So right. today we're living in a very different world where where um, it's not that it's taught. Tol- it is tolerated. But, behaviors but some, are tolerated yeah. today that were not tolerated a, a generation or two ago. Right. Okay. Right. So it sets up a different challenge right. for adult caregivers, whether they're parents, neighbors, or teachers. Right. And and the reason I think that some of that stuff is tolerated now that wasn't tolerated before is because of the way that it was managed before. Right. You know, right. when we look back and we say, oh my gosh, you know, if I would have asked my father why, I, he would have <laughs> backhanded me. And so I don't want to do that to my kids. And so... Right then they when you know we allow our kids to ask those questions and to mm-hmm. challenge those questions and stuff but the the, the challenge the, the concern or the problem or the, the focus of today's podcast is going to be on how do we handle it when those things that beca- that maybe even start out as discussions right. turn into arguments mm-hmm. um how do we handle that right because well, we'll get into that. And, and we're talking about limit setting. Right. You know, years ago, limit setting was a backhand. Limit right. setting was because I said so. Right. Limit setting was, uh, we're done talking about this. Today, limits, you still have to set limits, but you don't have those kinds of options. Right. You, you have to use different approaches. So, yes, you still have to set limits. It's not okay for this girl to, to curse on the tennis court or anywhere right. else, uh, you know, a teenage girl to, to curse anywhere, but, but um, not on a tennis court. So we still, as the adult caregivers, we still have to set limits, but we have to do it in a very different way today than we did a generation or two ago. Right. Because, you know, if we think about it, and just as you're talking about that, I'm I'm thinking about limits and boundaries, you know, in the past, because everything Mm -hmm. was, things were more physical at that time. When we were riding in the car, because of course at that time we didn't have to wear seatbelts, right? Because it was safe to ride without seatbelts in those days, in those days. I knew exactly how far I could lean up to where my dad couldn't hit me right. going back this way. So I had a physical barrier. I had a limit <laughs> of, of where I could lean to where I, I could avoid uh, the backhand. Today, in the car. In the car, right. So it, we, we had those more, more physical boundaries right. uh, in those days. Now we have more uh, cognitive or more thoughtful right. boundaries that right. we have to create with our kids as far as w- how far we're going to go in discussions and how much we're going to debate or mm-hmm. or even compromise. I, I think right. compromise is a, is a good thing, right. but there comes a time when, when it's just unreasonable, and so you have to find a way or be able to say, no, the discussion is over yeah. now. This is what we've agreed to, or this is what's going to happen. Mm-hmm. It's either this or this, and, and that's, that's right. it. And and again, I want to go back to this idea of boundaries because a, you know I say a generation or two ago, um, but in the let's say the fifties or early sixties, the our parents had smaller boundaries. Right, they, they were closer to us. Right. Um, now the boundaries are a little bit bigger. That all that's happened is we've become a little more tolerant. It doesn't mean that you put up with everything. You still have to have boundaries, right. but the playing field. The way I like to explain it is the playing field today for my children is much larger than it was for me. Right. M- my parents had a smaller corral that we were allowed to phone. We, we played in our neighborhood, okay, because everybody went to the same school. Right. Everybody lived in the same neighborhood. So our world was a little bit smaller. Today, it's the entire city right. because your your classmates come from all over town, okay? And so the, the playground, if you will, is a little bit bigger. So right. the boundaries are a little bit bigger. Right. But the, you still have to maintain boundaries. Right. So, so let's, I I guess this first part that we're going to to focus on is the the purpose of arguing. Uh, And and the purpose of arguing differs depending on which side of the argument you're on. If if you're on the parent side of the argument, the the goal here is to, um, just to put it very bluntly and very directly, is to impose your will uh, upon your child. Exactly. You want them to do what you want them to do in the way that you want them to do it, 
Period. End of story. You want to convince them that you're right. Right. And they are, if not wrong, at least misguided. Right. Okay. That I have the wisdom here. I'm right and you're wrong. Right. That's the parent perspective. That's the parent perspective. Surprisingly, (laughs) or maybe not so surprisingly, that's almost the same purpose of the cat to teenager side. I was just gonna say the 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 goal on the teenager side is to be heard, to be uh, uh, validated, to for you to hear their and appreciate what they have to offer to this discussion, and so the and to te- acknowledge that they might be right too. So the teenager is trying to convince the parent right. that he or she is correct. Mm-hmm. That mom, you don't understand what it's like. Right. Okay. I'm right on this issue. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so so they argue from the exact same perspective as right. the parent. The parent is saying, I have the wisdom. The child saying, I have the current wisdom. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there, there's, I, I saw a wonderful cartoon. Um, I, I think I saw it on Facebook. And there were there was just two characters were standing there on a sidewalk. And in between them was the number, uh, was like either a number six or a number nine. And this person over here said it's a six, and this person over here said it's a nine. Right. And it, and and the caption, of course, was just because we have different right. answers doesn't mean that one of us is right and one of us is wrong. Right. We're just looking at it from different perspectives, and Good. and I think that that's a, a wonderful view for us to take while we're while we're talking about arguing with teenagers, right. mm-hmm. because sometimes from the from the world view that they have, they might be correct. They might be right. Mm-hmm. But you might be correct also. Right. And, and so this is where, I think that this is really where we get into those scenarios where, where parents and teenagers argue and argue and argue, and, and it doesn't ever get anywhere. And, and it's because, in, in, in many ways, you're both absolutely right. Right. Mm-hmm. Or, or at least mostly right. Mm-hmm. And, and if you're mostly right, why would you back down? But if the teen, if if you're the child or the teenager is mostly right, why would he or she back down? Right. Mm-hmm. Because if you can't see it from each other's perspectives, you're convinced that you're right. Right. And they're yeah. wrong. And so I need to explain that in as much many ways as I can. And that's the first, the first warning that we want to issue here is that when you get into these arguments, it needn't be who's right and who's wrong. There needn't be a winner. Right. Okay. And I think that's the first place where we get into trouble. That When people begin to argue, they feel that somebody has to win the argument. Right. Nobody has to win the argument because right. it might be a six or a nine right. separating you. Um, so don't enter these things thinking that you have to win. Right. If a parent thinks that they have to win every argument with a child, it's going to be a very long adolescence for both of you. Right. So let's take winning and losing out of the equation. Right. So, so again, sort of the first reason why we get into those arguments is th- this issue of right and wrong. Right. That, that we feel as though we have to impress upon our child that they're wrong and that we're right. And, of course, the teenagers are to do Nobody wants thing. to be told you're wrong, right. I mean, including teenagers. Nobody wants right. to hear you're wrong. Um, so don't don't go in with that you're wrong. Don't go in with somebody has to win this. Right, yeah. right. Now, a- another reason why these arguments perpetuate is... It's really simply avoidance. You know, if you ask your teenager to do something and this begins an argument, right. part of it could be just, I just don't really want to do it right now. And so <laughs> I'm going to see if there's any way that I can avoid this as long as possible. Right. It's time for bed. I don't want to go to bed. Okay, I don't, there's no argument <laughs> here. Uh, but it's time for, but you know, parents will engage in this battle that really does nothing but serve the purpose that the teenager wants it to serve, which is to delay. Stay up. Stay, yeah. yeah they get to and, and that's usually for younger teenagers. You know, right. old, older teenagers don't necessarily do that as much, but, but certainly, you know, your 12, 13, 14 year olds who still have maybe a, a rigid mm-hmm. bedtime right. um, and all, you know, you, you'll get into those kinds of arguments that just, and, and that's of course not restricted to teenagers. Uh, kids right. do that too, but um, it's, it's an argument that that we allow ourselves to fall into. We get drawn into their argument. Yeah, it's like yeah. why? Why are we arguing about that? Right. right. That's right. Yeah. You know, why? Why? Why even engage in it? Yeah. yeah. And, and so, you know, what 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 I recommend to parents in those who experience that is, um, 
you know, it's time, it's time for bed. Well, I don't want to go to bed. Okay, it's still time for bed. I'm going to go brush my teeth. And Can't change bedtime. You just bedtime. walk away. Right. There's, there's no reason to stay engaged. Nine times out of ten, if you just, mm-hmm. okay, well, it's time for bed, and I'm going to go brush my teeth, and you walk away, within a few a minute or two, mm-hmm. they're going to get up and they're going to go because, right. okay, there's, you know, of course, you have to make sure that you've done all the other preparing for bedtime stuff so they, they don't have the TV on and they don't have their electronic stuff and all that kind of thing. But if if you've already taken care of all of that and now it's just the actually time to get in bed, mm-hmm. you know, there's why argue? Why fight? Just, okay. Well, the parents would say, because he has to go to bed. Mm-hmm. Right. Okay. He'll go to bed. Eventually. So what you're saying is, don't allow that to become an argument. Right. An argument is a different. Exactly. And I think that's what that's what we that we want to say here is that we understand parents saying no, he has to go to bed, he has to go to sleep. We understand that. What we're saying is, going to bed and having an argument are two different things. Th- those are two different things. Right. And, and Separate having, those two things. Having an argument is going to do two things. It's a re- uh, using this example with bedtime, it's going to do two things. One, it's going to delay the time to get to bed. That's right. Because now we're going to be arguing. Right. The second That's thing the is... the surest way to extend the bedtime. Right. Is to have it, to add an argument to so, the... So de- we've now extended bedtime, say, 15 minutes. Or however long the or argument. Or however long the argument takes. Right. Mm-hmm. But now, because we've been arguing... Mm. Mm-hmm. We've got some testosterone going. We've got some energy going. Arousal and, is up. Right. Mm-hmm. And so now the time in which it's going to take to get to sleep right. is longer. Okay. And so you have, in essence, extended by getting by engaging in this right. argument, you've now extended actually going to sleep time, which is more important than bedtime. Right. How long, right. When, what, what time do you go to sleep? And how well you're going to sleep. Right. Mm-hmm. You've extended that at least... 30 minutes, if not an hour. That's right. By getting into this argument. That's right. Because you've already, the argument, the reason we separate the two, uh, bedtime and arguing, is that the argument um, does a couple of things. Number one, it extends everything. It disrupts sleep hygiene. It disrupts the sleep process. What should you be doing at night? You should be disengaging. Right. You should be coming down. You should be relaxing. You should be getting ready to go to sleep. And what's the argument? The argument is taking you in the just the opposite direction. Mm -hmm. So it's extending the time. It's extending the bedtime. It's ruining, demolishing the bedtime routine. Right. And then it's going to interfere with your sleep. Okay. And so that's why we say let's let's. These are two separate things. So let's keep them apart. Um, don't get into those kind of arguments at night. Right. Also, nighttime is when we have less inhibition. Right. So we're likely to say things yeah. at night that we wouldn't say, that we would have enough self-control not to say during the day. Right. Yeah. yeah. So, so be careful of those nighttime arguments. Yeah. So so watch mm-hmm. out for those those arguments that, that are there just to avoid or delay. Mm-hmm. You know, take we could use a hundred examples. You know, right. take the trash out or, mm-hmm. you know... Um, you know, turn off your game. There's going to be arguments about all those things, and, and right. you just those those are ones just to avoid, and, and just no, this is it, and and you can be absolute in those. Um, and, and this is a, that's especially well done when you have that structure already there. Right. When that's you right. when you have a routine, so you can say, no, dude, it's nine o'clock. Right. Nine o'clock is when we turn everything off, and it's time for bed. And that's the advantage of having the routine. When right. we say to you, you have to have a nighttime routine. Because if you don't have a nighttime routine, then this this could happen every night. I right. mean, I don't want to go to bed now. You know, I want mm-hmm. to go to bed a half hour from now. Well, if you don't have a set bedtime and a set routine, you kind of open yourself up to right. these, uh, yeah. the possibility of having an argument or a debate or a discussion each night. Right. So, get, so, so you, your routine, your your schedule mm-hmm. should include as many things as you can. So, mm-hmm. okay, so we're, we're going to eat dinner. We may not have a specific time for dinner, but... The rule is, uh, after dinner, you take the trash out. Right. Okay, so there's no, when dinner's over and you say, hey bud, you need to take the trash out, and he says, I don't want to take the trash out. Okay, okay, well, that's what we do. That's what we do here at, you know. Right. If you do it so, every night, it becomes a habit. So you can't, you, you can't turn your video games on, you can't go do anything else until the trash is taken out. Because without a routine. No argument, that's just how it is. Without those kind of routines, you're, you're then doing a directive at a time. Right. You know, take the trash out now. And every day it's different. Right. Okay. Yeah. Uh, maybe it happens. Maybe it doesn't. And that's when you invite these kind of arguments right. and discussions and debates. So yeah. get, set the routines first. Yeah. And, and then you can handle those 
uh, avoidance mm -hmm. types of arguments in a much much cleaner way. Right. Makes it much much easier. Mm -hmm. Now, now the third reason in which teenagers will engage in arguments uh, is simply for negotiation purposes. You know, they 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 will engage you. You will say, okay, you can go out, but you need to be home by ten. Why do I have to be home at ten o'clock? Right. I'm sixteen years old. <laughs> I should be. My friends can stay out until midnight. Why can't? Right. You know, okay, so we're we're trying to. It's a it's a maladaptive way to to negotiate or to have a conversation about you know trying to get something closer to what you want, mm -hmm. and it, it mm -hmm. devolves into an argument for unnecessary purposes. Right. And again, you know these are this is a a scenario where you really just want to have the conversation. All right, but buddy, <laughs> say buddy, bucko. Um, <laughs> This is a conversation. This is the way that I encourage folks to, to to do it. I I would love to have this conversation with you, but we'll do it when you're calm. Right. When you when 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 you don't want to argue about it, when you want to have a real discussion about it, that's when we'll talk about it. But until then, um, this is the this is the rule. This is what's going to be expected. And if the parent is angry mm -hmm. and defensive and argumentative and testy, you can't then calm your child down. Right. You right. can only occupy the moral high ground if you're calm. Right. You know, you can't say to your child, I'm not going to discuss this with you right. when you're in this aroused state or when you're angry. But if the parent is angry, mm -hmm. you've lost that right. advantage. Okay. Yeah. So don't 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 get there. Don't get angry. As tempting as it is, um, we, and we all have that tendency, don't get angry. You have to model the behavior you want. You want your child to have calm discussions right. with you, okay? Well, then you have to be calm. Right, and if you feel yourself starting to get frustrated, by all means, <clears throat> say, okay, this, I, I understand that this is really important to you. I'm starting to really get frustrated, right. and so I need to pull out for just a, for just a little bit. I need to wait exactly. just a little bit, mm -hmm. and we can, we can talk about this uh, again in a little while, but I, I can't talk about it right now because... I'm getting frustrated and right. it's just not going to work out well for either of us. Right. right. That's right. And, and, Disengage. And have that conversation. Own, Say that. Own your own emotions yeah. because you want them to own theirs. Right. Wouldn't it be nice if your child came up to you and said, maybe we better not do this now because I'm really getting angry. Yeah. Wouldn't that be a wonderful thing for a teenager yeah. to say? Where are they going to learn something like that? You have to model that sort of behavior right. for them. Okay. Right. So, so when you get into these um, circumstances where... We're getting into arguments, and we're, it's a negotiation. Mm -hmm. You know, again, calm yourself, encourage them to remain calm, and, and have a system in place for your family to handle negotiations. Right. Typically, typically, if you are a family that encourages discussions mm -hmm. like that, right. it tends to go well. It does. It, right. it tends to go. It tends to go nicely because your child knows. Mm -hmm. Okay, mom is a reasonable person. And if I present a reasonable argument, she's probably going to accept it. Right, right. And it, but in in the other situation, in the other families, mm -hmm. when negotiation isn't typically allowed, that's when we start getting into major arguments right. and fights. There's no point asking, right? Because it's going to be denied anyway. Right. So then they go out and hope that they don't get caught. Right, and that's when yeah, exactly that's when we get into the. Uh, it's better to ask for forgiveness than right. it is to ask for permission That's because right. they know that asking for permission means the means no. They're probably going to be denied. Right. Right. And so why why even ask? Mm -hmm. Let's just do it. Um, and it's so easy. Let's say it's you know. Let's face it. As teenagers mature, you know, from puberty to thirteen to fourteen to fifteen to sixteen, they're constantly asking us to do a little bit more. Mm -hmm. Okay, they're constantly pushing the envelope. It's a, it's normal. It's natural. You know, curfew was at nine o'clock, and now they wanted to go to ten o'clock, and then they wanted to go to twelve o'clock. And you remember, they have friends and associates who have no curfews. Right. And so this doesn't seem so abnormal to them as it does to us. Right. Okay. Well, everybody else. We know everybody isn't doing it, but some kids are doing it. Right. And some kids are allowed to be up at 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning mm -hmm. texting their friends. So you, your kids are right. Other people are doing it. Not everybody, but other people are doing it. And so we have to give them the opportunity right. um, to, to discuss, to push it out a little bit. Right. All you have to do is 
do a couple of trials. You right. know, let's say your child says, well, I wanna stay out until 10. Give her the opportunity to say, right. see how it goes. If it goes well, you can do it again. That's a win-win. Well, and, if it doesn't go well, dial it back. And, and, it's, and it's easy to, it's easy to uh, figure out how and when to do that. So say your daughter is gonna go with her friends to the movies. Right. Okay, the movie starts, uh, we'll just use round numbers. Say the movie starts at eight o'clock mm -hmm. and is over at 9.30. Okay. And so you say, okay, we'll come home after the movie, so you should be home by 10 o'clock. Well, yeah, I, the reality is, is that sometimes after the movie, because you can't talk right. during the movie, well, right. you shouldn't be talking during the movie, especially if I'm, I don't like it when people talk <laughs> during the movie, but you shouldn't be talking during the movie. So the reality is, is that when the movie lets out, they're gonna need to uh, file out of the theater, they're right. gonna need to go to the restroom, they're gonna get outside, and they're gonna wanna talk about the movie. They're gonna wanna talk about what they just saw. Mm -hmm. And so to say, so when your daughter says, um, can I just come home at 10.30 instead of 10 o'clock? Well, that's, that's not unreasonable right. because they probably want to stay. So allowing it and having that conversation, okay, you know, yeah, you're probably gonna, I know the movie gets over at 9.30, mm -hmm. but you're probably gonna wanna talk to your friends a little bit afterwards. Right. Okay, you, you come home at 10.30 right. and um, you know, then we'll go from there right. or whatever. It gives you, it gives them the opportunity to say, okay, well, mom is very reasonable right. about this and, right. you know, and there she's gonna be much more driven to be home by 10.30 then she would be at 10 o'clock if you said no, 10 o'clock, you come home straight right after the movie's over. Right. Give your Because you, she'll just come home and say, I'm sorry, you know, they were, there was a lot of traffic, mm -hmm. it was really difficult to get out right. of the theater. Right. You know, yeah. There's gonna be excuses for why mm -hmm. she didn't go home at 10 o'clock, but it's right. for the reasons that she really wanted to stay until 10.30 anyways. And in point two where we talked about the bedtime, right. and we said you have to have this routine, you, you have to establish a routine. You know, this is how it works. This is when bedtime occurs in our house, right, right period. You have to do the same thing with, with, with this kind mm -hmm. of a situation where you have to say, I mean, if you have a teenager, we hope that you've had the discussion about when is it okay to date? Right. When is your, what is your curfew at age 15? Mm -hmm. What is your curfew at age 16? What is your curfew here? What is your curfew there? So you have to establish all this ahead of time so that your teenager isn't coming to you and saying, well, I want to go on this date. You know, she's 14 years old. And he's like, right. honey, we don't date until we're 16. Right. Okay. You, you you have to stop having those discussions. If if this is what the family has agreed to, no, we don't date until we're 16. Okay, that's just the way it is, and that's right. why it's going to be. That's not going to change, no matter how much you argue, no matter how much we debate. That's not going to change. Right. Okay. So so they know not to have these arguments, and they can say to their friends. So a guy asks them to go out, and say, "I'm sorry, my parents don't allow me to go out right. until I'm 16." Um, it takes them off the hook. Right. They can use and, the parent as the excuse. And it's got to be. Uh, you know, and I, I love that example, but but that 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 means that the parent has to be consistent with that. That's right. That means that if a really good friend from church, their their son wants to take your daughter to the movies, mm -hmm. and you really like this guy, that you can't say, hey, why don't you go to the movies? I'll make with an Steve exception from... this time. You can't do that. Can't do it. If the rule is sixteen, then the rule has to be sixteen right. because as soon as you let her do that, as soon as you let her go with this guy. Uh, when she's 14 to, to go to the movies or something, mm -hmm. a, a, as innocent or as appropriate and okay as it could be, mm -hmm. as soon as you allow that to happen, she's gonna come home and say, hey, this guy at school wants to go to the movies tonight, can I go? Mm -hmm. And you say no, your argument's gonna start right then because, right. well, why was it okay for him? Why was it okay mm -hmm. for me to go to him? And you, the, the argument of, well, I know him, or mm -hmm. well, you know, because he, he goes to our church, and so we, I know, you know, I know his family. That's only gonna take you so far. You're saying, I trust me, I don't trust you. Exactly. You know, that's, I mean, exactly. that's the other message that you're giving your teenagers. You're saying, I trust my judgment about your boyfriends. I don't trust your judgment about your boyfriends. Right. And that, that leads to hiding and sneaking and, that's when and you're deceit. Gonna, you're and inviting those trouble. Of things. You're yeah. invite, when, when you start making exceptions, um, like that, mm -hmm. you begin to have you begin to have trouble. But um, so so set this set the systems get the systems in place. We have a place here in our town. There's a place where kids go to movies. Right, and it's called a theater. And so got him, <laughs> got him. <laughs> and so how can I do? So and and 
everybody has this argument. When can I go to the theater by myself? Right. At what age can I go without? Because typically what happens is we go with our kids. Right. We we sit in the same theater, mm -hmm. not with them, but right. but we sit in the same theater. A few rows back. Right. <clears throat> then we allow them to go alone, but we're in the theater somewhere mm -hmm. else. Okay. Yeah. And we take them there and we take them home. And then there comes that moment where they want to go without us. Right. Okay. At what age does that happen? Right. And in our time, you better set that up ahead of right. time because you're going to be asked and mm -hmm. the question's going to come out and you have to decide when in your family is it okay to go to this theater by yourself. Right. Okay. Um, and, and then you avoid the argument of them coming and saying, can I go, can I go, can I go? No, it's 14. You can't do that until you're 14. That's right. what we've agreed to. Yeah. Yeah. So, so having those, those boundaries established mm -hmm. uh, as early as possible is really important. That really helps. You should right. have a manual, you know, yeah. the teenage manual. Yeah. You know, this this is when you can go to the theater. This is when you date. This is when you can get your ears pierced. You we, know, need to, we need to write one of those. We should do that. Okay. When, when can you get your ears pierced? You know, what at what age can you get your ears pierced? Yeah. You know? I'm getting ideas about how we could do that. I'm right. afraid of that. I got an idea. So the other thing you have to remember, you had three points, right? Yep. Okay. Yeah. The other thing you have to remember is that a teenager's brain is different than our brain. Um, a teenage brain is not an adult brain with fewer miles on it. That's what right. one, one um, neurologist from somewhere, I forget where she is now, <laughs> um, Jensen is in there. She said, she said a teenager's brain is not just an adult brain with fewer miles on it. It's absolutely true. And one of the things that teenagers' brains, one of the differences is, when information comes into an adult brain, it usually goes to the front, it ends up in the front of your brain first, and then you make a decision. When information goes into a teenager's brain, it goes into the emotional structures first, right. then it goes right. to the front to make right. a decision. So you have to remember that as teenagers are listening to you, all that information is going to the emotional structures of their mm -hmm. brain first. Right. Okay? And they are likely to be more emotional than right. you simply because of the way, the difference in the way our brains work. Absolutely. So keep that in mind that all this information, and it's especially important if you tend to get aroused and angry and frustrated, that frustration is going to go to the emotional parts of their brain. And it's going to have a much different effect on them than it does on you. Yeah. So, so be mindful that everything's going to their emotional structures first. Yeah. So yeah. they're primed to argue. Yeah. Yeah. It's just, it's just what they do. Right. So, right. And it's not that they're bad. It's just, that's where their brains are. Yeah. So, so, you know, with, with some of these simple strategies, you know, having the boundaries established, mm -hmm. having the, uh, the, the rules, the set of expectations clearly mm -hmm. articulated, you know, recognizing in yourself when you're getting frustrated and when when things are progressing to the point where you mm -hmm. just need to get away. Right. Do, having all that stuff set is right. going to help you uh, uh, avoid arguments and, and fights and battles that just really lead to nowhere. That's right. And your children want to be able to discuss these things with you. They want to be able to negotiate these things with you. But you have to you have to make sure that they don't become arguments. And, and as soon as they do, you have to step away because you don't want to teach them that arguing is the way to settle anything. Right. And don't it's expect not. them to walk away because they're not no, going to be able to walk they're away. They're going to keep engaged. They're going to chase you. You know, parents or, say, well, I go into the bedroom and he follows me into the bedroom. Yeah, that's right. Because now you have an argument. Now, right. you have a, now you're getting into a problem. Or, or if they do walk away, they're going to slam the door. Right. It's okay. It's all right. Let them slam it's the okay. door. Don't create another argument about that. Let everybody cool off. Don't, don't, and, and so, so that will be something that will say, don't make it a rule in your house mm -hmm. that you're not allowed to slam doors. Right. Don't make that rule. <laughs> because that's. Someone's going to break it. <sighs> and it might be the parent. It could be the parent. And it, right. it, 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 it happens. And then, oh, well, it was an accident. Okay. How do you know it wasn't an accident? So right. now you're going to punish them for something that could have been an accident that they say was an accident, but you don't feel was an accident because you're frustrated and you see how that goes right. and it just leads to nowhere. Yep. So yep. put some of these safeguards in place, some of these, some of these strategies in place, and hopefully you'll be able to decrease and avoid some of these common arguments and common fights that we get in with our teenagers. That's right. And, and, and in the end, what do we really want to do with our teenagers? We, we want our children, when they're married, we want them to be able to negotiate with their spouse. Right. We want them to be able to 
manage their children. Well, how do they learn that? They learn it from us. Right. And we set, we set the example. Right. And if we don't argue, and if we don't get aroused, and if we don't get angry, uh, it's going to keep the temperature down, and they're less likely to argue. Absolutely. So they're learning a valuable lesson of how to negotiate differences. Absolutely. So. so, All right. Well, if you have any other ideas or thoughts about any of that, we encourage you, of course, to write into us. Yes. Uh, we'd love to hear from you. Um, we would also love if you wrote a review or uh, comment on iTunes. Mm -hmm. uh, always right. like those kind of comments and um, mm -hmm. ratings and all that good right. stuff. And uh, of course, you can find us on Facebook and uh, Twitter and all those fancy places. So mm -hmm. we, yeah, we would know. just love to hear from you guys. Yeah, so let us know. All right. Well, I think that's all for this week. So we will be back next week with, with loads more um, information and, and discussions. Yeah. Make sure, check your clocks. Make sure that this... I think that this weekend they, they fall This might be the weekend back. that time changes. I think so. Okay. So make sure. Don't, I, the, don't you know how I know Monday. that when time changes? I don't. My phone changes automatically. And so I just know. Over the weekend. Yeah. Wait, on Saturday at like 2 a.m. Or 2 a.m. Sunday morning, I guess it would be. I, you, you're, most of our uh, smartphones just change automatically. You don't have to change it. So that's how I'll know is I'll just wake up and it'll be a time and I'll say, oh, that's what time it is. That's how it works. <laughs> hey, attend, just find out if this is the weekend. Okay. Yeah, check that out. Cause I, and then, of course, uh, Monday's Halloween, so it'll be fun. So, all right, have, enjoy the weather. Uh, it's wonderful. So get outside and, and do some different things and have a wonderful weekend. Can I say one more thing? Teal pumpkins. Have you heard of that? Teal colored pumpkins? Right. No. Um, You're so fancy. No, it's for some cause. There's a there's a thing this year. Teal colored pumpkins. Teal is uh, the color for breast, uh, not breast cancer, um, brain cancer. No, it's not it's that. It's a brain cancer awareness. There's some other issue that, that people are they're becoming to no. awareness. No, teal is, no, it's not, it's not brain cancer. It's, it's another kind of cancer. Okay. Ovarian teal, cancer? Teal pumpkins. We don't have time? I'm not going to look at okay. it. Okay. Anyway, there, there was this thing about teal pumpkins. Find out what that's you see, about. You see, this it's, is what I work with. It's an aware... No, it's, an, it's, it's a good thing. It's a positive thing. <laughs> is it? And I meant to mention, I forgot, And um, but there's a whole thing about teal pumpkins this year. Um, it's some cause that I think I was... Uh, it seemed worthwhile. Have you seen some of them? No, I saw a picture of one. <clears throat> Go to Google and look up teal pumpkins. <laughs> We're doing this on the podcast. This is fantastic. Teal. We're Googling. That's that verb. Uh, teal pumpkins. Googling it. Um, teal colored pumpkins. Right. Well. And it's some. There, look at it. See? I just, typed right in, up, right? I just typed in teal and teal pumpkin was the first thing. Um, the teal pumpkin project. Um, right. Food allergy research and education. Food allergies. That's what it was. I would have never. It's get... about food allergies. Oh, that right. thing's ugly. And they're coming at, they're, it's coming at Halloween because kids have peanut allergies or different allergies to different foods. And so we want to make, we want to remind people that. Uh, some kids have food allergies, so it's it's about yeah, it's about. Food what do you allergies. just paint it teal? I think you just paint. Oh, yeah, they paint them teal. They didn't mm -hmm. like genetically modify no, a pumpkin no, to make no, it they're, teal. They're painted. They're painted uh, teal. Goodness. Yeah, so you might see teal pumpkins out there this year. That's interesting. Um, about and it's about food allergies. So again, be mindful uh, and to. and keep your kids safe. Yeah, absolutely. We need to come up with something. Uh, purple pumpkins. All right, we will yeah. see you guys next week. Have, Have a good weekend. Have a great one. And to be afraid. <laughs>